Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just hit that notification button to be notified about our next show. You are live with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We've got an awesome program for you today. Uh, later on, uh, we'll be talking with our good friend Ted Kritsonos about sound bars. Father's Day is coming up, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a new one from Sonos and uh, some other uh, models that you might want to check out for dear old dad. If he hasn't got a sound bar or the TV hooked up to some type of speakers, this will blow him away. It'll change his life. So uh, you'll need to stay tuned for that. So we'll be talking about some uh, great uh, soundbar gift ideas everywhere from uh, 100 bucks to $1,000. We will also be talking with Peter Vogel. Uh, there are some issues with Earth's magnetic uh, magnetosphere. Uh, satellites and spacecraft are malfunctioning high above us. Uh, there's, I guess, a big hole. I, I didn't even know this was happening. Did you, John? You know, I, I think I did because I saw Peter's post on Facebook about it. <laughs> okay, so that's the only reason I knew. But anyway, this is fascinating stuff, and uh, you will find out if we need to be concerned about this. Let's uh, talk about some of the uh, the tech news happening this uh, week, uh, John. Uh, a big thing happening uh, with the protests uh, all across North America and you know, obviously spreading throughout the world. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of uh, issues around facial recognition, all these protests are happening. People are concerned that their faces might get caught up in this. We're finding out now that a lot of tech companies have uh, got all sorts of facial recognition software that they have been using, but also licensing out to the police. So this week, uh, a number of tech companies, including Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon, have basically made statements saying that uh, they're uh, holding off on the facial recognition uh, software right now, and especially letting uh, governments or police forces use it for the near future, which just begged the question, I didn't know this was happening. Did you? Well, I, I think we certainly knew that facial recognition was happening. It just, it's kind of surprising to hear it coming from some of these vendors like Amazon, for example. Um, you know, how is that being utilized? Is it just something they're doing internally and then they're making it available? But where are they getting these photos from or this, the content that's being recognized? Um, one aspect would be that makes sense for Amazon was in their um, cashierless stores, for example, the idea is you walk into the store and the camera recognizes you, it figures out your Amazon account, you pick up stuff and you can walk out with it. That makes sense if you're willing to go that route, and, but it's not something that's widespread. So I'm kind of curious as to what level of tech this has been deployed to the world, let alone what the police forces are actually using it for. I think the big problem, though, John, is that there really are no, you know, strong laws uh, regarding this as far as, you know, our overall privacy uh, when it comes to, you know, people using our faces uh, in, in this software. You know, there are companies that now that are literally collecting millions, if not billions of photographs of uh, people around the world. One of them, I think, clearly AI. Uh, Clearview. They, is that the name, I think? Yeah. Clearview, uh, yeah. Yeah. And they have been collecting you know, billions of these photos uh, that are now being used in uh, their, their database without people's permission. So again, uh, technology blazes forward and society and laws uh, get left behind. Well, I think it's one of those cases where, you know, the technology is cool and interesting, but no one ever stopped to ask why are they doing this and, and how does this make things actually better? Um, just because the technology ex exists doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for us. Well, we're seeing now Microsoft uh, basically said uh, they will uh, stop uh, using it or licensing it out to uh, police departments. Amazon says the same until some new laws come in place. IBM has come out and said that uh, they are just stopping all sales development and research of uh, facial recognition tech. They're not really clear on if that's forever or just you know for a few weeks or months. Well, there definitely seems to be what, like, like you touched on, the fact that a lot of these uh, research arms and departments, they want to wait until there's more clarity on what the implications of this technology is and those privacy laws to support them. Because, you know, no one wants to be developing the, you know, the nuclear bomb knowing it's going to be used for a bad thing. Right. So uh, it's the same kind of thing with this is I think some of these researchers are, are, are questioning the morality of some of the tech that they're helping to develop. 
We'll be talking a little bit more about this on the app show tomorrow, including an app that helps uh, with privacy when it comes to taking pictures by uh, helping uh, blur people's uh, faces out. So you'll want to stay in, uh, stay tuned for that uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. here on CKNW 980. What else has got uh, us interested here, John? Um, Apple, they've uh, added a, uh, a new Mac trade-in program in Canada and the U.S. So I guess you can go into the Apple stores now and trade in your old, uh, your old gear for new stuff. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good move by Apple. I mean, I, I believe this is something that was available uh, to before where you could go in via their website and you would, I think you actually have to mail in your items. Uh, but now you're able to do it in the store. And if you recall last fall when the uh, the new iPhones came out, Graham and I both traded in our phones uh, and at the Apple store. And, you know, it's you don't get top dollar like Craigslist or eBay money for it. Um, but if you take the hassle factor of dealing with Craigslist or eBay out of that, it's actually a pretty good value, at least what I got with my for my iPhone. Uh, I felt it was a fair trade-in value for, you know, a good condition phone. Um, it's unclear exactly what kind of trade-in values you're going to get because I think there's a lot of variables for people's equipment. And this, you know, this applies to iPhones, iPads, uh, the watch, and, uh, and also your, your hardware, like your iMacs and your, and your laptops. Haven't really got details on pricing uh, yet, uh, but we'll be following on that story. And uh, we do have a blog about it up on getconnectedmedia.com if you do want to read more uh, about it. John, I, I want to talk about another story we've been following for literally months and months now. And uh, this is the uh, ongoing Phonus uh, SIM card. Yes. And so enlighten our listeners again what this SIM card was all about. So Phonus, the company, uh, F-O-N-U-S, uh, for those spelling at home, uh, it was, the idea was that it's, you, you buy a SIM card and, you know, of course, pre-pandemic, this sounds like a really great idea. If you're traveling, you get the SIM card. It's 30 US uh, a month for unlimited everything. That includes data, texting, voice, and roaming. So you can use this SIM card literally anywhere in the world. Um, so again, it sounds like a great deal. It sounds like super undercutting what a lot of us currently pay for our uh, Canadian carriers for something even close to that. Um, and so last, last year, uh, in November, December, I can't remember the exact date, uh, when we, or we found out about it, we talked about it. Uh, a bunch of us ordered it myself, AJ, and one of our producers, Steven, we all ordered, ordered them. I did not. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and so Last week, uh, I, I got my SIM card. Steven got his a couple days later, and AJ got his like yesterday or the day before. I can't remember the exact day that he got it. Um, not long after we ordered it, uh, there was an email that went out about the fact that the first 500 customers get free service for life. It was part of a promotion for this. Um, and we, we all got the email. So we're like, hey, this is cool. I mean, we were willing to pay the $30 a month for this plan, especially... Um, at least at that time, we were doing a lot of traveling and this would have been huge savings for our roaming fees uh, just to use this SIM as a dedicated travel SIM. And so last week we talked about getting these SIM cards in the mail and I hadn't activated it yet when we recorded the show. And uh, so I had an interesting chat with Simon Tian, the CEO of Phonus on Twitter. He called us out about uh, some inaccuracies about our re reporting, although it was really just us anecdotally chatting about our experience so far. Um, we also had a number of listeners write us in, uh, both through our normal channels and even personally, both Mike and I at least uh, have been contacted by some of our listeners saying, hey, I finally got my SIM. You know, it was months delayed and uh, I went to activate it knowing that I had this free service for the first 500 customers and I was denied. And uh, so that was one of the things that I was concerned that we were helping facilitate something like this that could be perceived as not a real legit thing uh, if they're being promised things and then they're not giving them that service. But it, sounds, it almost sounds too good to be true. Well, it does because it is a very compelling offer for sure. Sorry, 30 US a month, right? That's right. Yeah. Unlimited worldwide data, talking, everything. Like you, you can't beat that. No, no, no. It's, it's a very compelling offer. Um, so in the course of 
a large number of tweets with uh, the CEO of Phonus uh, and the Get Connected team. We basically, I think, have come to an understanding. <laughs> uh, uh, Simon has said that a, the, the, there was a miscommunication with his customer support people. So if you did get a SIM and you were one of the 500 first customers with an email and you were denied, you should try again. Uh, apparently that problem has been corrected. Uh, I tried myself to activate my personal SIM that I purchased and it came up as you need to pay. So Simon has said you need to contact customer support and then they'll sort that out. So um, that's where that's at. Uh, he has said that they're getting uh, more SIMs out every day. They're, they have lots of customers using the service. So again, um, not passing any judgment, but the fact is, is that these took a long time to get to us. Lots of reasons why. Uh, don't know if it's excuses, blaming it on the pandemic, whatever, doesn't matter. People are getting the SIMs now. And uh, personally, I don't have a need for the SIM right now because we're not traveling. Um, but that's where it's at with Phonus. So hopefully we can ha maybe have Simon on again at some point in the future and talk about the success story. Because the thing is, I really want this service to work and I want it to be real, as does everybody. So. Well, we'll be following up on uh, that, and um, I'm happy to see that those uh, those sims are going out. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to find out about a giant hole in the magnetosphere and uh, what that means for humanity and poor little satellites up there. You're listening to Get Connected here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. You're back with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We're going to talk about the magnetosphere and uh, when we have anything science and tech related uh, that needs uh, in-depth uh, reporting, we've uh, got our good friend Peter Vogel. He is a physics teacher and tech writer, one of the uh, friends of uh, Get Connected. Thanks for joining us today, Peter. Thank you for having me, Mike and John. Uh, I came across this story uh, this week, and uh, it, it sounded interesting to me. Uh, I'm, I'm always worried when like a giant hole opens up in the atmosphere <laughs> somewhere. Uh, tell our listeners what the magnetosphere is for and uh, why uh, it is weakening or, or what, what's happening with it. Right. Well, the, the magnetosphere is actually a term that describes how the solar wind interacts with Earth's magnetic field. And we're fortunate to live on a planet with a magnetic field. In, in fact, I could probably rephrase that. Were it not for the magnetic field, we wouldn't be here having this interview. We wouldn't be living on this planet. So it's actually a very important uh, part of protecting our atmosphere and uh, deflecting this solar radiation that streams out of the sun at incredible speeds on the order of, uh, I think, in miles an hour, a million miles an hour. So. Uh, uh, were it not for the magnetic field surrounding the Earth, uh, parts of that solar wind could strip away the atmosphere, and certainly the radiation from it could uh, impact life. From what I understand, it's lost almost 10% of its strength over the last two centuries. Right. So that, that, yeah, that was the, the news story, and it, of course it attracted uh, uh, some of the popular press uh, and as usual, some of it was misinformed. Yes, indeed, there has been a reduction in certain parts of Earth's magnetic field, um, not uniformly. The field isn't uniform across the planet. And in fact, there are these two regions, uh, one that goes back to 1970, the South America anomaly. So there's this, this was noticed as we took detailed measurements of Earth's magnetic field that there was a reduction in uh, a black hole, if you were, uh, in uh, the um, uh, magnetic field. The story more recently is of another such anomaly off the coast of Western South Africa. So it's called the South Atlantic anomaly. And this is, again, a, a sort of black hole or dip in Earth's magnetic field. And we have a, a swarm of satellites that, fortunately, the European Space Agency has launched, and they map Earth's magnetic field extremely carefully and closely. And so they're able to detect this. But it's not uh, unusual. These things have likely happened before. And uh, the actual uh, decrease or fluctuation in these two anomalies is within the sort of 
measurement fluctuation that we have of Earth's field in any case. So we're not all going to die. We're not going to die. <laughs> and uh, yes, someone wrote me when I posted about that, uh, thinking that this was another man-made catastrophe a la global warming. Uh, but I assured him, uh, A, that it wasn't uh, fake news, it was real news, and B, nothing to worry about because we can't do anything about it. We don't even understand the mechanism of Earth's magnetic field. So it's nothing that we can control. So it, is there going to be any issues that this causes? Uh, you know, are satellites going to have a problem? Sure. So the, as we said this at the outset, and as you said, uh, it's important to, to life the magnetic field on Earth. So the variations in it can impact um, uh, low-flying satellites, low-Earth orbit satellites. Uh, they sort of up to the range of the space station, four or 500, maybe 1,000 kilometers above the Earth. They have very delicate electronics, and in a region of reduced magnetic field, this solar wind, this stream of particles, electrons, protons, alpha particles, can damage this delicate uh, electronic mix on some of these satellites. Would that be something like the Starlink that we talked about previously? Would those yes, be the, the Starlink, of course, was interesting from an optical perspective. Um, you know, what was it going to do to uh, impact uh, astronomy, visual astronomy primarily? Um, so that was a different kind of issue, uh, but from an Earth perspective, yeah, quite similar uh, in, in that aspect. So overall, for human beings and life, uh, we don't need to be concerned. But uh, if you're in the satellite uh, business, it's something to, to, to be looking out for. Yes. Uh, and and the, the, these satellites can be $60, $100 million a piece. Uh, they, they, the operators and investors don't want to lose these. So the, the very expensive ones have um, uh, shielding on them. Um, the occasionally the geosynchronous satellites, which are much higher up, uh, 40,000 kilometers or so, will have to uh, reorient themselves to minimize a, a sudden pulse from the sun, a solar flare, if you will. And th those are much higher flux densities or much greater uh, um, intensity streams of these charged particles. So they take some evasive action. Even the, the space station sometimes has to take such action uh, as much as it can. We're talking with Peter Vogel. Uh, he is a uh, physics teacher and tech writer and a uh, friend of the, uh, the show. Peter, I want to thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is an interesting story. You're back with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler, broadcasting from our home studios. I want to talk maybe uh, about some uh, more Father's Day gift ideas when it comes to tech. Uh, a big one uh, would happen to be sound bars. Uh, these are great speakers uh, that uh, you can place uh, under your TV or above that uh, can fill the room with sound from your favorite movies, concerts, uh, and music. On the line, we've got our good friend Ted Kritsonos. Uh, he has uh, written a great uh, review for us on the new Sonos Arc, which we will be talking about, uh, but uh, also to help discuss uh, maybe some uh, other alternatives to that as well. Thanks for joining us, Ted. Always good to be with you guys. Ted, uh, the big news this week, if you're in the uh, the audio world, is uh, Sonos has uh, released the new Sonos Arc soundbar. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, to replace their older one, uh, the Play Bar. Uh, this thing's expensive, thousand bucks. What are you getting for a thousand bucks, Ted? Well, you're actually, I would argue you're actually placing two products because there's the Play Bar and then there was the Play Bass that came out in 2017. You guys probably remember that that really that flat speaker, right? So th to me, the Arc is replacing both of those products. And really what you're getting is, I mean, you're getting a big sound bar. This thing's 40 inches wide, so uh, it's, it's pretty long. And that actually works in its favor in a lot of ways. So inside, you have 11 drivers. There's a lot going on inside. You have two that are facing to the side. So they literally go, you know, 180 degrees, like, outside. And then you have two upward-firing drivers as well, which – plays into the fact that this is the first Sonos product that also supports Dolby Atmos. So a lot of Sonos fans have been asking for this for years. They always held off. They never did it. Finally, they've done it. So it's a, it's a big deal. If you're, into, if you're looking for Dolby Atmos uh, content and you want to hear something a little different as far as sound goes, the, the arc is your, is, your, is your ticket in. Can you explain to listeners what Dolby Atmos is? 
because I don't yeah, think so, most people know. Yeah, so Dolby Atmos is, is essentially it's it's um, it, it's surround sound, uh, obviously at a higher bit rate uh, than than you would typically get, uh, which is why you can only get Atmos if the TV and the content you're watching supports it. If your TV doesn't support it, then at least the box you're using has to support it, right? So you, you need to have a chain of compatibility here in order to get it. Now, when you have those things in place, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's very dynamic. It's fantastic. It really is great. And it doesn't really matter the size of your room. You could be in a small room. You could be in a larger room. It really is great. So the main thing to take away is that it's surround sound, but is, it is at a higher bit rate. It is the best quality Dolby can offer you when it comes to that. So Ted, just, just for the listener's benefit, uh, where would you get Atmos content from? So there is some content on Netflix and some of the other streaming services that do offer Atmos. It's not always easy to know if it's there or not because it, they, don't, they don't really broadcast it. It's not like, oh, hey, here's a, here's a list of content that's, you know, that works with Dolby Atmos. I kind of wish Netflix would do that, but they haven't. So instead, you, you'd have to go online to find what is and isn't compatible. Uh, with with Atmos, unfortunately. So I, I do hope that the services will make it a little bit easier to for, for users to know because, I mean, if you're getting a, a soundbar like this and you don't really know about all this stuff, you're just going to assume that all the content is, is encoded with Atmos, but it's not. Does it do any upscaling for content that isn't? Not that I'm aware of. The Arc, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. No. No. So at, but, Atmos kind of stands for atmosphere doesn't it yeah pretty much i mean it's 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 giving you the impression that you're in a surround environment now bear in mind that if you pair the arc with two sonos ones or the ikea symphonic speakers those work too two play fives so basically any sp two speakers that are the same that sonos has the smaller ones you can pair them so that you have rear and left channels behind you right that's the setup i have here with the arc it is phenomenal. I cannot recommend it enough. You could go with a Sonos sub if you want the extra rumble of the bass. I don't know that you'll necessarily need that if you're in a condo or apartment because you're not really going to get the full effect of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the sub if, you know, unless you want to wake up your neighbors. I mean, that okay. But uh, otherwise, uh, I would always recommend a sub more for a house. Uh, and the Arc has quite a bit of bass in it. In fact, it surprised me. I didn't expect it but it's got quite a, quite a thump to it. Uh, and especially you feel it even more, I think, when it's in a surround setup as well. Do you have yours mounted uh, or is it sitting on a mantle or how, how do you have it configured? So funny you mention that. So in the review, it'll, it'll be obvious uh, because uh, the, it's so long and the, the entertainment kind of console that I have where I have everything on there is actually shorter it's, it, <laughs> than, than, than the sound bar is. So it, it looks comical uh, on it. And, and, and I mean, because I had the beam before and the beam is almost half the size. I mean, the beam is about just shy of 26 inches. So not half the size, but I mean, it's considerably shorter. The arc is a lot longer. So if you, if you have a console that's going to be less than that, I mean, it, it, it is going to stretch out over. But as I said before, the longer length actually is a benefit. For one, because it's almost as long as the TVs that we have, right? Typically, we're, you know, we're looking at 60-inch TVs on average that most people have now. So it's almost as long as that, and, it, and it, just, it just suits it really well. So, no, I just have it laying down, but you can wall mount it if you want to. Ted, you've tried a, you know, a number of uh, different uh, audio devices and speakers and sound bars. Is it worth $1,000? Is there a noticeable difference? I think, it, okay, it, 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 I'm going to preface that with what you're upgrading from. So if you're, if you're going from just the TV speakers alone, it, it's, I mean, night and day wouldn't even describe the difference because as TVs have gotten thinner and smaller, the biggest thing that has affected them is audio. The audio has gotten worse. If you were to compare the audio of a TV from 2008 to now, the 2008 one was actually better than the ones today. I know TV manufacturers will say otherwise, but that's not true. So if you're just using that, then yeah, a soundbar like this, I mean, it'll blow you away completely. If you already have a $1,000 soundbar and you're not in the Sonos ecosystem at all, I think you'll have to weigh out what it is you're trying to do because 
to me, if you're buying a Sonos product, there's a good chance that you're probably going to go with more of them later on. You will expand that ecosystem. And if you're going to buy one of these, at some point, I definitely recommend getting a couple of the rear, a uh, couple of speakers for the rears, because it'll change everything as far as what you're listening to. So just for the listeners out there, some other features of the Sonos uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, the nice thing is that it's uh, typically wireless. So all you need is the power. You don't have to have any other cables or speaker wire going to it. Uh, This particular one also has uh, the voice assistant capability into it uh, as well. So you're able to use uh, Google and uh, Amazon Alexa if you uh, so choose to uh, actually just talk to it. (laughs) One or the other. One or the other, though. You can't use both. Yeah, one or the other. You can use uh, one or the other to turn the TV on, to play your favorite songs. It's it's pretty amazing uh, stuff. Okay, if you don't have $1,000, what else are you recommending, Ted? Um, the Beam from Sonos is like half the price. It's half the price. So the Beam right now, funny enough, looks like a bargain next to the Arc, right? And because of the smaller form factor, it, it, it I think works better in multiple rooms. So if you're looking for a sandbar that you wanted to mount and you wanted something a little bit more low-key, you could realistically mount the beam into a bedroom so that would be one option and the beam is great and again it's the same thing if you pair it with a couple left and right rear channels the beam is really really cool so there that's one option now one soundbar i would also recommend if you're on a budget i've tested it myself it was really impressive was the denon dht s216 i know beautiful name but that that soundbar is it, it punches above its weight completely you can't do surround with it because Denon's, with Denon, you can only do surround with their Heos products. But even so, if you're in a small place, a condo, an apartment, and you're looking for a soundbar that's, that's going to make it feel like you've got a little bit more power and you want, you know, you're looking at, we're looking at $250 to $300, uh, that one's really good. Now, that soundbar does DTS. No Dolby, but it does DTS. And it's got a couple of cool features in there to help expand the sound even more. So I, I was very impressed with it when I tried it. And John, you have one that you'd recommend as well. Yeah, although I don't have the model number in front of me. Um, I, I recently upgraded my TV and I wanted to get a matching soundbar for it. And I got a Samsung one. I think it was on Black Friday. And it was on the lower end of the spectrum. I think it was about 150 bucks, maybe 200 regular. And I got it for about 120 at I think it was at Best Buy. You and can't it, beat that. <laughs> no, and it sounds amazing. And, it, you know, it, it's got a lot of the same features uh, that Ted mentioned. Um, it's got a wireless sub as well, which I have behind my couch, which just fills up my room. I am a townhouse living room, so uh, I can be as loud as I want, but I don't need to be crazy loud with it. It just sounds really good. Even my video games sound amazing on this system too, so... I guess the bottom line is uh, if you currently have a TV and you're just using the TV speakers as the sound, pretty well any sound bar is going to make (laughs) the the audio better. You're doing yourself a disservice if you don't upgrade the speakers. I mean, if you're, if you bought, if you paid all that money for a TV and you never upgraded the the audio, you're you're actually doing yourself a disservice. That's one of the first things you should be doing after you buy a TV is to get something to enhance the sound so that you're, you're, you're matching the quality of the picture with audio that's commensurate with the quality of the picture you know what i mean like that's that's that that's always been my advice as far as uh as far as audio and sound goes i think it's also probably worth noting too that you need to make sure that you understand what your tv has and supports to connect to the soundbar because you can get a a, quite a lot better quality of sound just by using an optical connection for example well okay we gotta we we should actually clarify that because I, I set you up for that one. Yeah, because if you if you want to go with Dolby, okay, Dolby Atmos aside, if we want to go with Dolby Digital Plus, if we want to go with with you know sort of the steps below Atmos, which are really good still, you won't get those if you're going with optical. So the Arc does not have an optical connection. You can connect from HDMI and use an HDMI to optical adapter if you want to your TV but then you're limited to Dolby 5.1. Still cool, still good, but you're not getting the higher levels. If, however, you connect from HDMI to the HDMI ARC port, this is key, every TV's got one of them. So if you connect to that HDMI or ARC port, then you've got a two-way connection, although Sonos kind of blocks the one, you know, it going one way, but nevertheless, uh, that is where you're gonna get the full gamut of what the soundbar can do. And on top of that, you can control uh, volume with, you know, using the Sonos app. You can control 
uh, using the remote as well, or even your voice, because you can tell Alexa or Google Assistant to you know lower the, uh, the or lower or raise the volume. So that that's key. I would definitely say you should only use optical if you're absolutely desperate. Like if you all your HDMI ports are taken or you can't figure out any other way. Otherwise, allocate the HDMI ARC port for the the arc. I have one other question for you, Ted. What do you use to test the audio quality? Do you play music? Do you have a specific video clip that you like to show? Everything. Like, like what's your show-off piece, though? Uh, so so I, what, the way I do it is I'll use a streaming services like Netflix, uh, Crave, uh, Disney+. Plus. Then I'll use content that I have from Plex, so content that I have on my own uh, home media server, right? Because the... The, the, the encoding is different. The audio encoding is sometimes very different depending on I mean, some of these files that I've had for well over a decade. So there's that. Then there's music, streaming music, and then like something lossless like Tidal. And then after that, we got video games, right? So you want to see how all this stuff, you know, sounds. Now, unfortunately, we don't have live sports really going on right now. So I couldn't really test that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, that sort of testing all of that stuff gives me a good idea of what the range of the soundbar is. So for music, for example, the surround setup that I've been talking about is not gonna play as big a factor for music. You really kind of want the music facing you, not necessarily you know, coming from everywhere. Uh, but when it comes to watching a show or a movie on your hand, you do want that. So it's, it, it, it sounds great no matter what it's playing, to be honest with you. I mean, even, even gaming was, was awesome. So especially with all the sort of background sounds, uh, and that's why surround's really cool too. If you have a, an enemy kind of coming up behind you, the rear speakers will tell you where they're coming from. That's me, Ted. Coming to get I know you. it's you, Mike. I know it's you. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking with Teddy K, uh, Teddy Christonos, Christonos uh, out of Toronto, all about uh, some uh, soundbar choices for your uh, dad's uh, Father's Day uh, gift. If he hasn't got some sort of speaker for the TV now, any of these uh, surround sound, uh, or, or sorry, soundbar uh, speaker systems uh, will make a world of uh, difference. You got to visit our website, getconnectedmedia.com. Ted's done a fantastic review of the new Sonos Arc, and uh, you can read all about it. And I just, I want you to go there because uh, there's a lot of great information, and uh, it'll help you make some uh, decisions if you are in the soundbar market. Again, getconnectedmedia.com. Thanks, Ted. Always a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. You're back with Get Connected, Mike and John here. I want to encourage you to hit our website. We've got a lot of great stuff happening up there right now. Uh, a lot of uh, daily articles and blogs uh, in the uh, tech world on how to make your life funner and uh, easier. We have contests going on all the time as well. On the newsletter tab at getconnectedmedia.com, we uh, would ask you to subscribe to the, the weekly newsletter. If you do, our gift to you is uh, continued entry into our uh, monthly contests. You will be entered into all of them. We're literally giving away thousands of dollars of prizes uh, every month. This month, it's a great little Belkin prize pack. It's got uh, an Apple Lightning cable in there. It's also got a Wemo uh, smart switch or plug and a, uh, a dual wireless charger. You can actually charge two of your wireless devices at the same time. So if you've got one of the latest smartphones, uh, maybe some... Uh, uh, Air, AirPods uh, that do wireless charging, uh, this is the thing for you. Again, www.getconnectedmedia.com. you got to tune into our uh, sister show tomorrow, the app show. We've got a lot of great stuff happening uh, there as well. We'll be talking about Tidal, the music subscription service. And uh, should you subscribe to that instead of Spotify or Apple? We'll give you the lowdown. And if you've got one of the new Huawei phones, we're going to explain how to easily get your favorite apps on there as well. And we'll be talking, we'll be talking with uh, Kirk LaPointe from Business in Vancouver about uh, Huawei's uh, 5G endeavors here in Canada now that Bell and TELUS are not using their equipment. I want to thank everyone who helps put the show together, including John, Stephen, Nigel, Paul, Christina, and AJ. We'll see you again next time.